All right, today on the People Progressing podcast, I'm so excited. I have the premier, in my mind, the premier business leadership man in Denver, Colorado, Mike Zollner, who grew up in Colorado and, and uh, has some grandkids that are now the sixth generation Coloradoans. So you can tell that he has a um, special place in his heart for Colorado and, and Denver in general, um, and has done some great, great uh, things for not only the people of Denver, the city of Denver, but the business community of Denver. So Mike, thanks for coming on. Why don't you just kind of introduce yourself, tell us where you grew up um, and a little bit about your family background and what you kind of like to do as kids and, and all that kind of stuff. Oh, thanks, Joe. It's great to be with you today. And uh, hello, everybody out there in uh, in uh, podcast land. Uh, um, so I, um, I grew up in Wheat Ridge, Colorado. Uh, my, uh, my dad, uh, grew up in Wheat Ridge and, um, um, uh, went to uh, Catholic schools for most of my, well, really all but one year of my, uh, my life. Um, uh, and, uh, we, uh, my mom and dad built the house I was born and raised in. And then when I say built it, I mean, they laid the brick, uh, pulled the wire, um, all of that. So, um, and I had Christmas in that house for 48 years. And uh, so uh, pretty grounded, uh, my, uh, my mom's side of the family um, is where the sixth generation comes from. Um, her grandfather was a, was a silver miner up in uh, Nederland and Blackhawk area. Uh, my grandmother um, went to St. Mary's uh, grade school up there in Central City and is in the cemetery up there. Um, so anyway, it's, uh, that's, that's where the generational thing came from. Um, I was the first in my family uh, uh, on either my mother or father's side to go to college. Um, and uh, so uh, uh, went to uh, St. Peter and Paul grade school, went to uh, Regis High School, and then um, I was a, a baseball player. And, and one of the only, uh, the only full ride scholarship I had was to Trinidad Junior College. So I played down at Trinidad for a year. Uh, that was important uh, when your dad's an electrician and you're the oldest of four. So, um, so played down there for a year and um, um, uh, tore my ACL. And as a catcher, that's, that's not a good thing. Um, tried to come back and, and uh, uh, tried to walk on at Creighton University uh, because the academics at Trinidad were just not as challenging as I was really looking for. And, and uh, so I was starting to look forward after that injury. And uh, anyway, so went to Creighton and um, uh, uh, got a degree in finance and, and then stayed there for law school um, also and, um, and always wanted to come back to Colorado, but also wanted to get away from Colorado for a while and see what life in another state and another climate was all about. And um, so it was great. It was a great uh, learning experience. I was very blessed and very fortunate to have that uh, that sort of a path as, uh, uh, to to launch me into my career. So you, you you have a law degree. So you're you're a lawyer. You're also uh, have your real estate license as well. And um, what was it like going out to to Creighton for the first time? You know, you mentioned that you had to go to Trinidad because of the full ride scholarship. So I'm sure I'm sure it wasn't easy financially to go out to a place like Creighton. Um, what were some of the obstacles that you had to overcome to get through that? Well, it was, um, I picked Creighton partly because of um, uh, my then girlfriend, now wife, was going to St. Mary's there uh, for nursing school. And I was a big Jesuit fan. And so Omaha, there was Creighton University and there was my girlfriend. And so both of those were factors. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I had never been to Nebraska. When I left, I you know kissed my mom and dad goodbye on the on the driveway and and took off and uh, crossed the state line. It's like well here we are, and you know we're going to figure it out. And um, you're right, I didn't um, I didn't get any scholarships or any academic um, support there, so I had to kind of figure it out. I I did a lot of uh, I worked a lot of jobs as a bartender as a I was an RA in the dorm. I ended up putting foosballs in the main floor of our dorm to make some money, um, did just found a way to did some student loans, uh, did whatever I had to do to, to get through school. And, um, but I was pretty focused on 
on getting an education and, and that that was the number one thing I was there for. And then once you, you graduated, you came back to Denver, is that when you started working for Lincoln Properties? It, there was some fits and starts in there, Joe. But, yeah. um, you know, I, I worked for in the oil business for a couple of years um, because it was so hot in 1981. And uh, so I learned a little bit about the oil business and an investor when the oil business tanked um, and an investor in, in some of our drilling partnerships um, hired me to do some things. I did some weird things with French perfumes and bakeries and, and um, uh, started some retail stores. And it, it, was, it was an awkward time, especially with, with three kids. And, uh, but then in 1984, uh, Nancy rightly said, you know, you got to get a real job. Uh, and, and, you know, don't forget about these kids. And she was, uh, we were all having some anxiety about some of the things. I would, but I wanted my own company. I really wanted to be my own boss at some point in time. And I think I wasn't ready then, but I, the, the heart was willing, you know, but uh, uh, anyway, so I went to work with Lincoln in 84 and um, have been in the, in the apartment business and the development business ever since. And uh, so that was a good, that was a good uh, career choice for me. And let, let's get into it now. Let's get into you starting a company uh, called Red Peak Properties. Um, that's really the first chance, was that the first chance you had to own your own business at that point? Yeah, so um, so Lincoln, like Trammell Crow and a lot of other uh, real estate companies at the time, was really set up in terms of individual partnerships, and you became a partner in your operation here. So I had a small piece of, of what we were, the value we were creating in Colorado, and that became a bigger piece over time. Um, so from 84 until 89, um, or I'm sorry, until 98, I was with Lincoln, and so uh, 15 years there, and we did a lot of, of good things, but, and I could create a bit of my own culture here, but it was still under the Lincoln flag and, um, and sort of the, the um, uh, control of Dallas and San Francisco. And so then in 98, the Western region of Lincoln split apart, and I was one of the founding partners of Legacy Partners, which is a, was a new real estate company at the time. And that was a step toward independence and toward a next step in, in control and trying to create my own environment and um, doing my own uh, deals and, and, and creating my own culture. But it was more of the same. We just sort of kept doing what we were doing and I was frustrated. So then in 2001, three years later, I formed Red Peak. And that's when I was, was able to do a full you know, startup just the way I wanted to. Um, you know, I was the guy, I was the, the capital that invested here locally. And then we had a, a pension fund co-invest with me. And so we had long-term patient capital, which most everybody in the real estate business wants, but it's very hard to come by, um, particularly in, in 2001. So, um, but they believed in, in me and the story and I'll be forever grateful to uh, the state of Washington's pension trust for believing in me. And, um, and so that's what started Red Peak. So when you started Red Peak, you know, let's get into culture building, because I think that's a huge piece of business leadership. I think it's the maybe the most important piece of business leadership. What was your vision of the culture that you wanted to have at Red Peak? For your workers, for the people who um, rented apartments from you? And just everyone involved with Red Peak, what was your vision of the culture that you wanted? Well, I think there were several things, several pillars, if you will, that were really important to me. Uh, one was that I wanted to create a, a, an environment and a structure and, and a culture where everyone felt like they were partners in the success of the organization. And so right up front, we created sort of a, a hierarchy of of folks who would um, participate in the profits, um, but that would filter all the way down to, to really almost um, half of the company um, at, the, at, the, um, at, at the end of the day. And um, the folks who were really top performers and you know, behaving, creating value and behaving like a partner. So you start with that. I think um, another big piece of what we wanted to do was to create this environment where, where family was a priority um, and families come first. 
And, um, but it was also that you have a family at home, um, however that's defined for an individual, but you, we also wanted to create another family in the company so that you had each other's back when a coworker had a sick child, you would fill in for them. And it was a, it was a separate family, a, another family unit, if you will, that had all of the, the love and all of the support and all of the, um, just all of the ingredients of a successful family uh, as best we could define that. Um, and I think it was also then um, creating an environment, another big piece of what we tried to do was to, to, to uh, say that we would collectively uh, create our goals and we would all buy into these are, these are the goals that we all um, uh, acknowledge as being important for a successful organization. Uh, and, and then let's create strategies underneath those goals to accomplish them. And then underneath that, let's create action items that would then support uh, the strategies and the goals above them. And then who's responsible for those action items and then hold them account accountable for accomplishing those, those action items. And so that was from the very beginning, I would say those are three sort of really important pieces of what, um, of what I wanted to create. And I think we were very successful at that. I think you were too, because every time I was down at your office and so forth, it, it that's a, if I if you ask me what what do you see what I see is a family atmosphere um, of, of people who cared not only just I was just coming down to see you one time I remember I was downtown and I just dropped in and the people treated me like I like I was part of their family right from the beginning I just walked in and said can I see Mike and and um, I see that I saw that just oozing out of your culture big time. And the other thing that you mentioned there, it sounds like you gave your people a lot of empowerment to, to take ownership and be accountable in, inside of your company. Would you say that was part of your strategy there? Absolutely, absolutely. Very high on the list that, um, that when you're behaving and thinking like a partner, then when an issue or a complaint or a request comes to you, you own it. You take ownership of it. You're gonna you're gonna see it through. And if it if it's uh, too you have to go too deep, then you need to, you know exactly who you who you call to get an answer to to solve that problem. Um, and and if that ended up rolling up to me, I was happy to take that call or email or text or whatever it was to say, okay, I let customer satisfaction, uh, resident satisfaction in our case was was very high on, on, on what I think it takes to be a, success, a successful company. Um, and so we wanted to empower people to own those issues and, and behave like a partner. And, uh, and, but this family environment was, was really critical because um, when it, it, I've always subscribed to uh, servant leadership uh, and that you really um, want to live and lead from your heart um, and you want to connect people to a higher purpose and and you know I think that's what families are all about uh, uh, honestly and uh, um, and that um, and, and that's it's helped me uh, for 40 years of marriage uh, also and you know it's it's that uh, higher purpose thinking putting others ahead of yourself and um, uh, that that leading with your heart is really really important. Having humility and uh, being transparent, so that you've you, you have empathy for the people you work with and you uh, or you serve, and you uh, you put yourself in in their place every day um, as you come to work. Uh, whether it's coworkers or the people you serve, you put them first ahead of yourself, and that's that's then everything just seems to fall into place after that. And people know how much you care about them when you do that. Right. 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 And, and I think that's yeah. one of the, go ahead. Well, no, I, I think it's, you know, it, it, it was, it was a little easier for us, honestly, because at the end of the day, we were working for the beneficiaries, uh, the pension fund uh, uh, beneficiaries in the state of Washington. So yes, we were getting some profits. We had a quality of life that we, as, as workers and as 
um, as, a, as an organization, yes, we wanted a piece of our success um, because we were going to work harder than anybody else and we were going to create um, uh, success uh, in real estate uh, at a higher level than anybody else because that was clearly what we were going to, what part of our goals were. Um, so we wanted a piece of that for sure. But at the end of the day, the majority of the, of the fruits of labor were going to those beneficiaries. So it was really easy to create inside our organization what, what that higher purpose is. And I, but I think that's true whether you're, you're coaching a team or you're coaching, um, you're, you're, you're creating a, uh, you know, working in a nonprofit or whatever it is, um, you know, that higher purpose and, and, and what this is really all about at the end of the game. I, I think that uh, uh, that's really important. And I, I, I have a saying that when, you're, when your purpose is greater than yourself, you've reached a level of peace that a lot of people don't have. In, in peace of mind and so forth. And when you're talking about the higher purpose, I think that's so awesome because um, when you're talking about your higher purpose, your higher purpose was those investors. The investors was the state of Washington pension fund and all the people that were invested into the Washington state in uh, pension fund. You were actually that you had it instilled in your people. Hey, we're serving a higher purpose here. We're trying to help these people with their pension fund and make that a, a, a grand scale purpose for your company. And when people have a higher purpose that's greater than themselves, do you think it helps them achieve more? For sure. For sure it does. Um, but, you know, I think that's, um, I, I, I think that's ultimately out there, you know, but profits are only a part of a successful company. You know, I, I've always, um, I've always, Jack Welch, who, a lot of young people on the call probably don't know, but Jack Welsh was the CEO of, of uh, General Electric. And he, he um, I wrote, read a lot of his books and he was really the guy who turned General Electric around and uh, they've since declined again. <laughs> but um, at the time that, that he was the CEO and they were one of the model organizations in, in, the company, in the country. And he had three principles for every successful organization. You know, one was, Customer satisfaction. If you have satisfied customers, um, that's important. Number two was employee satisfaction. If all your team members like who they work with and the environment that you create for them and they like to come to work, you're a long way to a successful company. And then the last thing was cash flow. Um, whether you're a lemonade stand or you're your uh, General Electric, you know, those three things, you've got a successful company if you've got those three things. Now there's various levels of success, mm -hmm. but it all starts there. And I think, so we had that higher purpose with the pension, but, but then you've got to, you've got to drill down. I, I mentioned that was the goal, but there were strategies and action items that then were personal to us. So it was in each of those strategies, there was also um, higher purpose, let's just say. It, it wasn't always about the, the, uh, the, um, the ultimate beneficiaries or, or, or our financial success. It was a lot of other things um, that led to uh, how we define success and how we, we, the culture we wanted to create for satisfied customers and, and, and employees. And the process, I call um, what you're talking about with your goal setting, I, I think it's great to have goals I think it's more important to win the process of achieving the goals. And you have a three-step tier process of doing that. And during that, all of that three-step tier process that you mentioned from your goal setting on down, everything inside of that was based on a higher purpose as well. Maybe not so much the pension fund, but what was the purpose of how are we going to serve our, our residents? You know, did our, did our residents feel like they live in a special place? And I can honestly say, I know your residents felt like it was a little different living in one of your properties than it was probably someone else's properties. Would you say that's true? Well, I sure hope so. I'll tell you, we went, to, we, we, uh, we all came to work every day with that being our number one goal. You know, there was, there wasn't a person in the company that wouldn't pick up a paper when they saw it, uh, or a person who wouldn't ask if they could help somebody or, um, we're, uh, we're always about, uh, we, we would survey our residents every, on a regular basis uh, to make sure we were, we were living up to our promise. And, and no matter what our results were, we wanted to deliver better results the next year. 
And so there was a constant measurement and, and benchmarking process inside that customer satisfaction promise. And, um, and so uh, it was, and, and we would compare ourselves to our peers uh, to make sure that we were delivering on that, that promise. And, and I think when you, when you get to that point, it's really easy to say, well, we're, we're good at what we do and pound on your, but you, you, it never ends. It's, it's, you, you never stop trying to get better. You never stop trying to push each other um, to stay on top of that peak. And that was part of where the name Red Peak came from in the very beginning. You know, we wanted to be the um, top performing uh, 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 apartment organization in Colorado. That was Rojo, Colorado. Rojo, uh, you know, was red. The, the first light on mountain peaks in the morning is, is red often. And so that's where the name came from. But it was an awful lot about operating at a, at a very high uh, uh, level of performance, peak level of performance. Oh, that's so awesome. Then let's go back into servant leadership because I know you're huge on that. You are on a lot of different boards and committees and um, you're chair of the Downtown Denver Partnership and, and so forth. Why do, you, why do you do all that extra stuff that's beyond your businesses that you are running? Well, I think um, there's always a I, I think I've always had a commitment to giving back and to a commitment to um, giving to the community, you know, giving to our, our church, giving to our industry um, that, that has given our family so much, um, commitment to, to giving your time to your family, all those, that, that commitment to giving. And I, I think um, I'm very fortunate at this point in my career that I have more time than I used to, to, um, to really uh, focus on giving back and trying to make our community a better place. Um, I chaired the, uh, the finance committee for the Together Denver campaign to fight that, uh, you know, the um, uh, public camping um, uh, initiative that was on the Denver ballot a couple of years ago, and that was important to me. Um, I'm proud of our success in, in, in knocking that down, but um, you know, and I, I'm also chairing the Urban Land Institute in, here in Colorado, which if some of your, your listeners are not familiar, is really the, the better real estate, it's creating the, the, a better real estate environment and the, the built environment, uh, placemaking and all of those sorts of things. So, you know, I'm really big on just giving back and, and trying to make the, how you're going to be remembered and how you can make a difference in your community for our grandkids. That's what it's about. It's not about me anymore. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's about our grandkids. That's 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 who I get up thinking about. Um, what can I do to make Denver a better place uh, from a real estate point of view, from a from just a, a, a functional point of view, and and uh, a healthy a business environment to grow in the future. So now, what's your what's your project you're doing now with your son Michael? Um, give us a little in, insight on how you started that, and again, what you, the culture that you want with that and and what you're trying to build there. Sure, so uh, ZF Capital is, um, is the name of our, uh, of our new uh, company. And, um, you know, honestly, we started as a real estate company and felt that that's what we were gonna do uh, because that's what both of us have done in our careers. By the way, I, you know, I, I encouraged Michael to, to work for somebody else uh, for eight or 10 years. Uh, and if it made sense for us to become partners, then it would happen. Um, and he did that. He worked for five or six different organizations and went to grad school, et cetera, after college to, to further his real estate career. And then, and so after nine years, then it made sense for us to come together. Um, and honestly, that was a big part of, of why I left Red Peak at the time I did. Um, you know, they didn't like the idea of him coming into the organization and that was important to me. I thought he was, he had a lot to, to offer. And if you're creating an evergreen company, that seemed like a logical deal. But anyway, um, this was, um, this was an opportunity for us to work together and, and for us, I think, to complement each other uh, with my experience and with his enthusiasm and, uh, you know, my, uh, my cynical nature at, at later in your career and his optimism and, you know, all of those things, I think, and, and we think about risk differently. And at the end of the day, that's what real estate's all about. 
is, is managing risk and, and um, relative returns to the risk you're taking. And so it, it's, um, so we started out as a real estate company and we still have uh, the lion's share of our, of our portfolio is in real estate, but we pretty quickly looked at the tea leaves and what kind of risk adjusted returns we could get in real estate. And we're doing much more lending now. We're, we're a first mortgage lender on several projects um, that seems like a better risk adjusted return for us. Um, so we're doing some lending. We're also, for the first time, uh, we've, we've made the decision to uh, invest in, in become more of a passive investor in a couple of uh, companies and organizations. Um, and um, that was a big leap for us because we like having control. Mm -hmm. And uh, at this point in, in, in my career, you know, you have either take on partners for capital, uh, which fortunately we don't need a lot of right now, or you take it on for opportunities. And so for certain uh, reasons, there are some, we're taking some, some partner positions in some investments now. Um, and we're, we, we've, we've, meant, uh, we've made an offer on a baseball team um, up in the, in the North, uh, uh, Northwoods League. Um, and um, so it looks, to, looks like that might, and we have a, a, a partner a guy who I played baseball with, well, actually played all three sports, uh, football, baseball, and basketball with from the time I was eight years old through my senior year of high school. And then we played in college together. So, and he's run five or six baseball organizations. So he's, he's the guy, we're just investing with him, but we trust each other and, um, and we wanna have some fun um, at this point in our career. And that's, uh, that's what we both like doing. Um, and so we're, we're looking at some baseball teams to potentially buy. Yeah, and so it's kind of come full circle from your athletic uh, career as a baseball player and so forth, all the way back around to investing in baseball teams now. Yeah. If, if, if I have a, somebody I know, let, let's just say somebody's out there and they're thinking about starting a business and starting from scratch and, and coming up with ideas and ways they want to run it and all that kind of stuff. What would be some of your advice to some of those people that want to do that? Well, um, that's a, that's a big open, uh, that's a big question. I, I, I think a lot of the answer depends on the industry and, and again, how much risk you have to take on. Um, and, and I think uh, a lot of people, for example, think, well, I want to be a real estate developer or, I want to be a restaurant owner, or I want to be a baseball team owner, whatever it is. Um, and um, there's nothing wrong with that because that's who I was and that's how I started. And so I'm totally supportive of people who have that fire in their belly to want to start a business. And, and I, uh, that's what makes America great. It's what makes Denver great. Um, you know, we want to cultivate an environment and, and a, be a place where people are excited to, to try new ideas and new things. And I think that's important. But, uh, you know, there's, the, there's industries cycle for sure. And there aren't many industries that don't cycle. Um, and so be honest about where the industry or the business you want to start is at in their cycle. Right now, I think a lot of people are confusing opportunity with just too much capital being available. Just because you get there's investors that want to invest with you, that doesn't mean it's a good time to start a business um, because there's just there's too much capital out there right now. This zero percent interest rate we've been environment we've been in for ten years, it's mispricing risk, and people are taking more risk than they think. So be careful about when you start. I think another thing I would say is is create an, an, an environment um, and, and make sure you're a person who is energized and excited by change. You know, I, I think that was something we always, that was always in my mind at, at, at uh, starting Red Peak. If you, if you start from the very first day, and, and this is with, if, if you're a coach, you know, th things are gonna happen on the field, whether it's weather, bad calls, you know, what your change is going to happen. And, and, but if you created an organization that is excited by change, this is our opportunity. This change gives us opportunity. We, we can, we can manage change better than anybody else. And if, if you get the people who around you who believe that and who, who uh, 
come to work every day uh, working for a team that knows there's going to be change, but you like it and you want to be part of it. And that's not, not everybody's built that way, right? Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of people that want to, they just want to go home at, at four or five o'clock and sleep really well at night and, you know, get up and do it again tomorrow. That's fine. There's no problem with that. And, and every organization needs some of those kinds of support folks. But that's not going to create the type of you need people at the top, people in the middle on the top who are going to say, I, I like change, bring it on and we're going to become we're going to grow and get better because of it. And I, I call that um, and kind of overlapping athletics and business um, at three levels. There's a, the eight to fivers, I call them, that they come to work, they do a good job. They're not really going to come early. They're not really going to stay late. They just want to come do their job and go home. Then you kind of have the middle level. It's, it's kind of the showcasers, and they're not real sure, but they're pretty good at certain things. But sometimes they have a hard time when the pressure hits, when the change happens. Um, they have a hard time with that. They have a hard time dealing with that. And then I, I call it, you have the gamers. They're the ones who just say, bring it on. Let's go. They look at everything as an opportunity, not an obligation. And in an organization, I think you always want to have your gamers try to bring the showcasers and the eight to fivers up to their level as much as they possibly can so that you do create that organization. Um, I, I think everyone that runs a business, I, I don't look at them as the boss or the manager. I look at them as the coach. And, and you've kind of described that great today about really what your job was, was coaching all your people all the time in coaching them to greatness, coaching them to think above beyond themselves, coaching them to serve other people in that servant leadership role. And it can only happen if the top person is, is a servant leader themselves. Wouldn't you agree with that? Absolutely. Absolutely, Joe. You know that, um, I think a big part of leadership is, in, is encouragement. And you know, encouragement really means bringing courage to others. Uh, so I think you have to uh, you have to encourage people. And, and that's what we were all about with becoming, you know, wanting to become a partner. Um, and, and so we, in our organization, we had, we absolutely compensated people on those three levels that you just described. Um, you know, the, the top performers, the really high end folks became K1 partners, which is a, a tax term, but it meant you were, you were actually owned a piece of the company. You know, and then we had what we call Team for Tomorrow, which is sort of that middle group that you talked about. And um, those folks, um, at a minimum, got one month bonus every year. Um, and then above that, they got a piece of the profits that we created. So they were at operating at that higher level. And then, you know, the folks, the rest of the organization was in the third tier. And so you either wanted and aspired to become, to get on team for tomorrow or to move up to the next level in the company where you didn't, and that's okay. But we, we created a career path for each and every person. And we, just like we checked in with our business plan as a company every year and monitored it every quarter, we did the same thing with career plans for each of our team members. Um, you know, we didn't have employees, we had team members. And we didn't have we didn't have tenants. We had residents, and so our book it starts with vocabulary. It's there's the culture. It goes to everything you do, and so um, you know this um, this you, you embrace the human dignity of each person, um, and and you you want to um, you want to meet them where they are, and and um, if you're not growing as a person as a team member you know, then you're dying. And so we, we've got to constantly bring everybody in the organization along to create an evergreen, healthy environment and organization for the long term. And as, as you as the, the leader, the, the, the one who started it and had this vision of this is how I want this to be and serving people and so forth. Tell me of the amount of gratitude you had when you saw somebody basically go from that middle level to the upper level and you saw them grow. And you know, the, the name of my podcast is the People Progressing Podcast because that's all I want people to do is continuously grow and progress and get better. What kind of feeling did that give you when you, when you were able to see the growth and progression of your people? Oh, it was the coolest. I mean, that's, that's what flips my switches. Mm -hmm. you know? 
it's it's not it's you get to a point okay you you know you've had a successful career financially you, you know what flips your your switches is it, it, it's I mentioned the giving back piece for sure but I also it, it's seeing uh, uh, other people's lift other people lifted up in the organization whether that was being able to you know um, to get a, a, a bigger house or for one of their spouses to not have to work anymore and be with the kids more or whether it was a second home or whether it would send their kids to college, whatever it was, th seeing those people move up and feel that they had accomplished their goals, they were, they were happy with, uh, you know, how that they were providing a better life for their kids, that flips my switches. You know, that's, that's what I like. To uh, to be part of and um, and and those people became lifelong friends and and they still are today. You know, I um, that's um, that's that's special when it happens and when everybody feels that energy of pulling in the same direction and accomplishing goals. That's a cool thing as a leader when you when you can uh, when you can all sit back and say we created something special. This was a great year. That was a great project. That was a great win, whatever it is. That's a cool thing. That's what that's what flips my switches. And what's so amazing about talking about all this with you is the correlation um, between me as a coach and you as a business leader. Because I could say the almost 100% exact same response that you just said in, in terms of my coaching. When I saw my players get better and progress beyond what they thought they can do, and, and I call it turning on the, the, the light bulb, switching that light bulb. When they all of a sudden they figured out, hey, I can do this. And hey, I can be even better than this. And then 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now, seeing them out in the real world doing great things because of the strategies and stuff we had to help them grow and build, not only as players, but as people. Right. Um, it's almost the exact correlation. And the one thing um, that I've noticed in this conversation as well is you've never really talked about profit. And, and I never really talked about wins with my players. I never made winning a state championship one of our goals. It was more about developing players and developing better, better players and better people. And basically, you're kind of saying the same thing. And my thing was the results of what we were trying to do was going to be the wins or going to be the profit in the end. And that's kind of what I'm getting the feeling you're you, it's almost the exact same thing because you've never talked about profit in any of this, but you've always been successful in that area. Would you say people first has helped you get the profits that you've desired? Oh yeah, for sure. You know, and, and uh, it's, it, 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 people talk about real estate as a, an investment vehicle or a profit generator. Um, you know, that's obviously true. And, and it's um, why you do what you do every day at, at the end. You remember cash flow was one of the mm -hmm. successful features of a, of a successful organization. But, but it, 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 um, what, the way you get there is really by operating at a higher level and creating a, an investment return that's different than a, a, a competitor that doesn't operate the same way. You know, it's why I never wanted to have a third party management company running our our company i wanted all of those and and a lot of people a lot of investors do work that way you know they just hire a third-party management company and there's some very good ones and there's some not so good and they you know they mow the grass and they sweep the floors and they keep the lights on but you don't feel the same uh about living in, in an environment like that and so we were always trying to create extra special living environments not an investment return, but if you create a, these living environments, the profits will take care of themselves. Right. And so, so, you know, it's, uh, it, it's, it, it all starts with the customer service piece. And that's, that's what generates higher returns at the end of the day. Yeah. And your people can't have good customer service unless they're happy themselves. That's if right. they don't enjoy coming to work, how are they going to make the people that they're serving enjoy what they're doing, you know, enjoy yeah. the service that they're getting? You have to be a compassionate, if, if you're a servant leader, you have to be compassionate for those you lead and, 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 and those you serve. And so you have to have empathy. You have to put yourself in their position. How do you want to be treated? What, where do you want to live? And, 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 you know, I always said I wanted to build projects that 
uh, that I was totally comfortable with our daughters or my mother living in them and, and was proud that they, that they would feel comfortable there and safe and secure there. And, and so if you, if you just had that empathy and that, um, that sympathy for those that you serve or those that you lead, good things happen. Okay. Last, last questions. Cause I could go on forever with you on this. Cause it's, it's so, um, it just makes me so excited to, to listen to all of this, but well, I'm going to ask you three questions here. What's your, what's your purpose in life? You know, I ask myself that uh, on a regular basis, Joe, and I and and it changes over time. And and what my purpose was when I was in college is different than when you have kids. It's different than when you start a company. It's different when you have grandkids. And so my purpose is, changes all the time. But at the end of the day, I think some things stay the same, and that is that you you want to leave. Uh, the community and the family that you have better um, than it started. And, and the, I'm constantly trying to create a, a stronger family, uh, a closer family, and a better community that, uh, uh, that, that is, is, is going to be that special place that you and I grew up in here in Denver that is the same for our grandkids. And um, that's, that's my purpose. So, uh, so let's go with that. Your purpose is greater than yourself. And you've, you've mentioned that throughout this whole podcast. Um, so let's go to this question now. What's your passion? What do you, what's, your, what's your passion in life? You know, my, I, I think my passion is really, um, is, is really serving others. It, it's really, how can, I, how can I use the resources and the time that I have today to, um, to leverage those? And to to really come back to the purpose, you know, that's my passion. It's it's uh, it's it's all about uh, giving, and it's all about um, uh, it, it. It's not about me anymore, you know. It it uh, that that's that's uh, not that it, that was in your in, when you're in college. It's all about you. Mm -hmm. and when you're married. It's all about your spouse. And when you have kids, it's all about them. And it's you know, it it you're constantly thinking about other people. Um, but you have to also take care of yourself so that you can, uh, you can continue to serve them and that you can continue to be around. So, um, you know, all those things I think are, uh, uh, get to what motivates you and what's purpose. So I have a saying that purpose equals passion and passion equals purpose. I don't think you can have one with the other and your purpose and, and passion completely match each other and they, they fuel each other. And, and, and you get to live your purpose and your passion on a daily basis. And, and most people, not most people, but a lot of people, 70% of Americans are disengaged at work and so forth. They're not living their purpose and passion every day. And um, I, that's one of the things I want to see and help change in this country. And that's why I'm having you on here. Last question, what, what's your perspective on life? What, what, what's some things that have maybe changed your perspective in life? Well, I think... Um, I think watching Denver change and evolve has, um, has really changed my perspective a lot um, about um, this, uh, this world that we're going to leave for our grandkids. You know, it's, um, it's not the same city we grew up in uh, at all. Uh, it's still one of the biggest small towns or smallest big towns in the country. Um, which is great. And I love that. I love the fact that we welcome uh, newcomers into Colorado with open arms. I like that we, I like uh, 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 that we are um, a welcoming place and that we value the outdoors, that we, we value our public spaces, um, uh, that we, that we re are respectful of each other and, and all of that. Um, but I, I worry that that's changing. I worry that, that, um, we're not as um, we're not as friendly to one another as we used to be. We're not as um, we don't think about the rural communities in our state as much as we used to. We don't value diversity of opinion uh, as much as we used to. Um, you know, everybody's trying to. You know, one of the great things about Denver has always been the collaboration that happens to make. Uh, the city the best to make the best possible decisions in our city 
and I, and I say this all the time when I'm talking to business leaders or political um, folks is, you know, Denver's a place that, it, it, that we collectively come together and say, what are the issues? What are the options? What, what's the best decision to make for us as a community? And then we go make it happen. You know, it's not silos. It's not mm -hmm. people saying, well, this is what I want, or this is what I need, or this is, it's about me. It's not, you know, making a great city isn't about me. It's not about the real estate industry in a silo. It's not about the banking or the, you know, the, uh, the, the nonprofits or anything in any one silo. It's all about all of us working together to make the best possible future for our kids. That's what's made Denver successful. And I'm afraid we're getting away from that. You know, we're turning into silos and we're, we're not listening to each other. And we're, there's too much self-interest and too much, um, uh, uh, you know, sort of radical change from who we are and who we've been. And, and that worries me. So we need, we need younger leaders to kind of take your torch. Well, we do, you know, there's a, 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 growing up in the industry and in the city, man, it, 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 my involvement in, in my career and my community, it didn't end at five o'clock. Right. And, right. and I, I worry that a lot of the younger people today, I, I get that their, their personal time is, is probably more important than my personal time was at their age. And, and I respect them for that. And I, and I think that that balance, that perspective that you're asking about is important. And, and, and I'm not d d uh, minimizing the, uh, the importance of your personal time and your family time and all of that at all. But I do think there's gotta be a place for giving back to your industry that you're in, for the community that you live in, you know, for your church or for whatever uh, is important to you. And you've got to make that time as part of your priorities every day. So that when you wake up, it's not just about you or it's not just about your company. It's about creating this, this better place for your kids. And, and uh, how, how do you do that? Everybody, if everybody contributes something and if everybody is at the table for those neighborhood organizations or, or neighborhood meetings or you know, whatever it is, then the neighborhood's going to be better. And you got to, you got to put the time in and, and be, be engaged to make that happen. Man, this has been, um, this has been completely awesome. Thanks, Mike, for coming on. Um, you know, hopefully so many people listen to this and get something that they can take out as a leader, as that business leader, as a community leader, as, as a leader of their families, leader of their church, so forth, because you hit on all of those different aspects of being a leader, and it all revolved around servant leadership. It all revolved around serving others, having a purpose greater than yourself. Um, and, and that's what I hope that people take from this message from you, who's somebody who's a highly, highly, highly successful business person in the Denver community. This can be taken into coaching, this could be taken into business leadership, educational leadership, any kind of leadership. And it's proven that you can be a servant leader who put people first and be successful in what you do. And that's what I hope people take out of this. And I appreciate you coming on. This has been 100% awesome. I, I just thank you so much. Well, thank you, Joe. And thanks for all that you do to try to elevate the um, these um, these conversations and, and uh, try to make, to get those other 70%, I think was the number you mentioned, engaged and thinking differently about uh, their day and their week and their career. And, uh, and so thanks for all that you're doing too. Well, I, I think just one last thing. I think we're, we were two of the lucky ones that we went to our passion every day and still do go to our passion every day. And um, my goal is to get the other 70% of people who aren't going to their passion every day to think differently and hopefully get to that point where they, they do get to go to their passion every day and have a purpose that's greater than themselves and, and so forth and make great things happen in our communities and so forth. Like you have done. It's uh, you're an inspiration and I appreciate you coming on, Mike. Thanks for being here and uh, best of luck with, uh, with your new adventures. I know you always got something cause you're never afraid to take a risk. And that, that's one of the things I love about you. So thanks for coming on and uh, we'll, we'll talk soon. Thanks very much, Joe. And get out there and support local businesses and restaurants, huh, everybody? You know, we, we, uh, they need you right now. And, um, you know, I'm not an Amazon guy. I got to tell you, 
but we need to support our local businesses now more and restaurants more than ever, ever before. So get out there and think about that before you push the, the uh, Amazon order. Always serving others. Thanks, Mike.